I want to see their files, Gissing and Oberman. I already checked. They're missing. But I recognize one of these names. It's in an X-file. X-file? Yes, unsolved cases. I file them under X. Why don't you file them under you for unsolved? That's what I did until I ran out of room. Plenty of room in the X's. Who decides when a case gets an X? The director's office. It's, uh, it's a dead end. No one's supposed to see them, but it makes for interesting reading. Welcome to Most Unwanted and X Files podcast. I'm Chex. I am joined by Luke. Luke, how are you today? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's uh, quite a blustery day today, but we're go- we're going to weather this storm. We are going to weather this storm. I mean, I don't know whether you can call it blustery. There's a slight wind, maybe. <laughs> it, I was going to say I've been reading about Texas at the moment, so I can't really complain. <laughs> you know what? Texas is one of those stories that, like, I've seen over the past week, and you know. I suppose it's because, like, we live so far away. But, you know, when a story just sort of passes you by, you mm. just don't really take note of it. Until yesterday. And, my God, what a crazy situation I know, it is abs- over there. Absolutely mad, yeah. I feel so sorry for everyone involved in it. Um, yeah, it just it just seems to get more and more bizarre. But I, I, I don't want to talk too much about it because I literally don't know that much about <laughs> it. But I've just seen, like, clips of stories and it just sounds insane. So... If you are anywhere near the area, I hope you're doing all right. Yeah. The weather is taking a mad turn all over the world. <laughs> it's almost like there's some kind of climate crisis that's uh, changing. <laughs> you're beginning to sound like Mulder, you are. <laughs> 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 <With your> crazy theories. <laughs> Every time there's like an extreme like thing of weather and you see, oh, it's mad, isn't it? And it's like, it is mad. It's going to get worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look at last year with, yeah. the, with the fires in Australia. Yeah, I know, I know. It was about this time last year as well. So, yeah. But anyway, that's, that's, regardless that's of that. a bit of a downer note to go on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's also really dull. And because like, we literally started talking about the weather and our intro. <laughs> the uh, most British thing we could do. So, these are the lockdown conversations you have. Are we ever getting out of lockdown, do you think? Luke? I I feel like this is it now. Like, I, it's coming up to about a year of me working from home. And basically a year since I've not left my area. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've, I've been to the closest town once since this has all happened. Um, so, yeah. I, and, and, yeah, it, it's coming up to, I think it was March. When was the, when did they advise people to work from home? I don't remember. It was like March or something. About it? March for us, yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, it'll be full on 12 months at that point and it's like my god I, I i don't i can't imagine the amount of things that we would have done in that 365 days but the funny thing is ever since we've sort of had to record this podcast remotely we've been talking about oh uh, maybe we'll buy like a new mic and we'll both record off microphone to make the sound quality a bit better and we've always thought you know what? It's, it's probably we're probably going to be back together in a month anyway. Let's hold off. And we just keep on holding off and holding off. We really should have bought some money back in last month. As soon as it hits, yeah. <laughs> but the problem is now, if we buy one now, we, it'll go all be over. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe we're stopping the uh, the, the pandemic from uh, from going back to normal. Yeah, I I apologise to everyone because <laughs> it's definitely our fault. Yeah. Um. How about we do a, a, a quick few questions with the boys to start us off? Questions, questions with the boys. Questions, questions with the boys. After the chase in the sunset, one of life's simple joys. Questions with the boys. Okay, so. I've tried to take themes from this episode, the, the episode that we're about to review um, today, and I've used them to come up with a few questions. Now, number one, I want you to think of a post-World War II era in time. Okay. What time do you think you'd have done the best in? Um... It can't be, it can't be like, you can't say... Oh, 1990. Like, 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 you can't see, like, where you are now. Yeah. Where, if you could live in any time period, where would it be? Like, after World War Two, Post-war, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, like, I don't want to hear, like, oh, 
Victorian England or revolutionary France. No, 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 none of that. Probably the 80s. I always like... I generally just like all of the music from the 80s, so... I, f- I would probably have fit in with any group in the 80s. <laughs> I know it's stripping it down to the... Water. I'd probably end up, I don't know, as some kind of... Uh, I've been affected by job losses because of bloody Thatcher. That's the only <laughs> trouble. <laughs> that is honestly the thing. Whenever I, I was thinking about this question, and the problem with this question is a lot of our sort of references or pop culture references to the 80s comes from TV shows that are more often than not American influenced. Mm. And so I think of 80s and I think of like discotheques and I think of like flare trousers and bright colours and, you know, like old fashioned cars. And and then you see like, you see like videos of the 80s in England and it's like the miners strike. (laughs) (laughs) It's people, people in in line for um, job seekers allowance. And Mm. it's just, it just feels like I don't know. How, I don't know what the eighties were really like in the UK. You don't really see it, do you? No, I. I. It, it's a weird thing to be honest. Like the um that like. There's lo- like I've, I know a load of people who are like, oh, I'd love to live in this decade. I'd love to live in that decade. But I always just think, oh, I'd like the internet. Like I don't know if I could live in any other decade at the moment. I'm too comfortable. Like so, I don't want to move. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. You wouldn't. You wouldn't know about the internet. It wouldn't bother you. Um, maybe I would some kind of like quantum leap style. I'd like have this like pang for my old life, and I'd just be like, "This place sucks." <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd be like, I don't know. I've always been. I always loved the fifties, but again, yeah. it's kind of just going off the music. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, I, it's not really about lifestyle because I don't don't really know. It's it's more about like what music I'd like to listen to at the time and like. It's like gigs you'd want to go to, do you know what I mean? That, I mean that's it's literally but, such a, a, an important decision, and it's based on, like, what... Oh, I'd, lo- I'd love to have seen the Beatles, do you know what I mean? Yeah, not, <laughs> not thinking about the socio-political landscape at the all. time. Just go, I really, I really like Depeche Mode. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's weird, isn't it? It's the, yeah. weird, the way you, your brain works. Um, but, yeah, like, 50s would be interesting it's like it's just after the war and i feel like it's the time where everyone's scared of the nuke (laughs) 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 sorry to bring in this experience you just want to have a coke (laughs) (laughs) okay that question didn't go as i I I think i think that went perfectly i don't know you're talking about (laughs) Well, on the same lines, we're going to go back to a young Luke Costin. Okay. 18 years old, Luke Costin. Now, <laughs> that, I, I felt offended then, and I was like, oh, yeah, that was like over a decade ago. Holy it shit. It certainly was. <laughs> that, that, that is no longer you, <laughs> right? If you could go back and give young 18-year-old Luke Costin, fresh out of college, one bit of information or bit of advice, what would you say? Um, something that I've learned more recently, I would tell my young self, don't stress about anything that you can't control <laughs> because it's not worth the hassle. That is very good. That's just good life advice in general. But if I was taught it earlier, way less stress. I might have hair. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, let's not go too far. We don't want to get really into the realms of ridiculousness. How about yourself? I think it's... A li- this is the thing. I think it's um, along the same lines. I think my big piece of advice would be um, work towards what makes you happy and rather what we think would make you happy or what you... I think happiness is like it's all relevant to you rather than what this sort of society tells you should be what you makes you happy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think there's a lot of, like, people... I saw saw something, and it was talking about, like, how people... It was Darren Brown, actually. I've been watching a lot lately. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was talking about how a lot of people constantly are working towards the end goal of life, like, you know, of to being able to retire and stuff. And it's like, but what if you get to that point and you're not happy about it? And it's like, oh, I've just wasted all of this time in my life getting to this end point that I'm not happy with anyway. And it's like... You might as well just, yeah, work on what makes you happy along the way, basically. Exactly. I think, well, 18-year-old me would have been working towards 
um, A levels in law and wanting to become a solicitor and stuff like that. And then when it didn't feel like that was the way I wanted to go, kind of feeling lost because like I taught myself that I had to be successful. Do you Mm -hmm. know what I mean? I had to be like this big shot guy. And like, don't get me wrong, if if that's what makes you happy, then all the power to you. But it just wasn't for me. Mm. I I think it takes a little bit of wisdom to sort of realise, hang on, it's not about... Yeah, it's it's a weird thing. Like I, I I I value time a lot more than I do money now, and that, I wouldn't have said that at eighteen years old. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that that perspective comes as you've lived more as well, because you you, it, you you realize I ain't getting those years back. So very good yeah. point. But then on the flip side, I'm thinking about like these conversations with our younger selves, and would we have taken it in? Probably like, not. <laughs> you probably wouldn't have. You probably because you know better that time. I sometimes you know Facebook memories. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> I get things pop up when I was like 18, 19, and I hate that guy. That guy is the worst. He thought he knew everything. Yeah, I, I think you you have this like self-assured, like you, you know the world, and you're like, why can't people see it from my point of view? It's and then you, isn't it? yeah, 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 and then obviously all it takes is to look back and just go, it's not that easy. It's not that simple. <laughs> I think I think you I think people build it themselves. I think you have to build it to get through that part of your life. Yeah, you need yeah. a sort of cockiness to sort of go out in the world. And I think it's only as you mature that you realise you don't need that. You don't need that sort of bravado. Actually, you can be vulnerable. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, and I think it's it, like like I said, it be it would change the person you are now if you had that knowledge then. I think you need it. I don't think you would listen. Mm-hmm. I am. Um... Yeah, I I can't remember where I heard it now, but I heard the saying the other day, and it was like the youth is wait uh, youth is wasted on the young, and it's like never never felt more true. <laughs> so true, it is but, so hey, true. And I imagine people who are much older than us are thinking, you don't even know what you're talking about. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. How, how ridiculous do we sound now? You know, in ten years' time, we're gonna look back and go, what was we talking about? <laughs> exactly, exactly. They think they know everything. <laughs> <laughs> wait till you get to our age, Sunny June. <laughs> that was two deep questions I didn't actually mean that so um, we're going to do a bonus third All right. nice quick fire favourite type of monkey uh, a gibbon <laughs> perfect let's get on with the show <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, straight away, pretty much, we get that, um, that like time, I guess, year. Yeah, 1990, <laughs> this is set. Yeah. So we know that. I oh, will. It's funny because last week we were talking about the film doing a sort of maybe doing an origin story. We don't know yet. Mm. This is basically an origin story, an origin story of the X Files. Essentially, yeah. This pretty much gives you the entire. Um, what the X Files actually are, uh, and it, it's quite underwhelming to be honest. <laughs> but then, what else is it going to be? I also like that this is like just a year on from because it was eighty nine, wasn't it? The one with the um, lone gunman. I think it was nineteen eighty nine. That one. Um, I'm, I can't remember off the top of my head. I know, I know, it's set before, and I think it was it was before this one. Um, but yeah, I I love any time we get these prequel episodes. It's 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 a shame because we don't get any Scully, but also we do get to see what Mulder was like in his formative years in the FBI. I suppose. Yeah, I love I love how every time we go back, Mulder's got a fringe. <laughs> yeah, like young Mulder just combed his hair forwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, we'll 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 get into the episode. It is especially because we thought this was going to be a Monster of the Week episode. It's weird to get this sort of. I don't know whether you. I don't know what you, can you call this mythology? I suppose it's, it is it's, mythology, isn't it? It's kind of like half and half because the actual like whatever was happening in it isn't or doesn't look to be related to the greater conspiracy and the the, the X Files, but it does have a lot of characters that tie into the greater conspiracy. So, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. It's kind kind of like yeah, half and half. I'd call this one. I'd agree. I'd agree. Um, we start off in Wisconsin, and we see 
a landlord and a police officer. And they're basically talking, they're still outside this house and they're talking about evicting what looks to be a, like a trespasser or maybe, I don't know whether he's like lived there and he's been evicted and he's not left or whether he's just sort of just lodging there or, or man, he's not allowed. But yeah. this guy's called Edward Skur. Mm-hmm. And the police officer goes to a victim. They, they go into the house and the house absolutely stinks. It, they, they're searching the house. They can't find anything until the landlord comes across something in the bathroom, and which makes him heave and runs out. Mm. And when the police officer goes to have a look, it's... How would you describe what this look? It's a, a corpse. Yeah. It's kind of like... It's been, like, dried out and kind of... Because initially he thinks it's like a leather glove, the hand. Um, mm. So, um, so yeah, it's kind of... They, they mention later that they've removed all the soft tissue, so I guess, like, they've sort of sucked it dry so it's just the skin and bone underneath i imagine yeah it's got the skin's got like, this leathery quality it's all folding over hmm. it just looks it looks like yeah like with, he's withered away all of his insides are just withered away and just left the skin hmm. um which is obviously quite horrifying um but he doesn't have much time to contemplate what's happened here because he gets attacked um by mr skirt but the police officer, and this surprised me because usually when this happens, it's it's not a good thing for the the person who is attacked. But the police officer gets the upper hand. Yeah. He's quick, and he and he's got his gun ready, and he fires and ends up killing Edward Skur as he as he, he falls down the stairs. But just before he dies, he whispers to the police officer the word "Mulder." Mm. So we, and get- then we go into the intros. So even before we've got into this. Uh- Mulder being in the X-Files, he's being dragged into these X-Files. So, yeah, he just can't get away. Yeah, well, kind of. I mean, we're led to believe that it might not be this Mulder he's calling for. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 interesting to see where, what we think about when we get to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we know this is going to be a, probably a Mulder-centric episode. It doesn't actually end up being that, really, or at least not modern day Mulder. Yeah, isn't it quite... I mean, both Mulder and Scully are quite... Um, well, Scully's not in it at all, and Mulder's yeah. barely in it, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. And you just sort of... It's more a conversation that leads to the sort of flashback, mm. and we, it's the flashback of the story. Yeah. Um, but we do see Mulder, and he's working for the... At this point in time, he's working for the FBI's Behavioural Science Unit, mm. and he goes to see... Um, a man that filed a report against Edward Skur. So obviously he's heard that this man called out his name and he wants to know more about it. And he goes to see a man who had filed a report against Skur, but all the information's retracted. Yeah. And he doesn't know why. He wants to know what's going on. Why, why is this being hidden? What's happening? And this guy who his name is Artie, Artie Dales or Arthur Dales, um, seems less than happy to help out. He's, he, he's like this sort of cantankerous old man. He doesn't really want to get involved. It feels like he's been burned before at this point. Yeah, um, yeah, it definitely feels like he's yeah sick of um, whatever this this story is and just doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And I mean, when we finally see his full story, it's completely understandable why. Um, but yeah, not helping Mulder in this case. Also, I did like um, seeing Mulder in there in 1990. Dress sense has not changed at all. Still wears the same coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is the same Mulder. Yeah. To be honest, it's, it's probably more in keeping with the times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, a little bit more information about Arthur. Um, we found that he's a retired FBI agent. That's why he investigated Skur in the 50s. Um, and this report mentions that he died in the 50s as well, mm. which obviously confuses Mulder even more. And he doesn't want to discuss the case. He basically says, if if Skurs died, then you don't, you don't need to talk to me and shut the door in Mulder's face. But Mulder goes home and he's sort of thinking the case over and he sees this... I don't know what he's watching, really. It's like a, a black and white sort of documentary of... What I mean, it's, it's something to do with like a courtroom with. It's like, the 
McCarthy. Yeah, it's the McCarthy like sort of stuff, isn't it? Like I don't know the ins and outs of it, but all I know is like they that McCarthy. There's like McCarthy era kind of like yeah, they just hunted for communists basically, didn't they? See, this might be my problem. Maybe this was meant to be recognisable, but oh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't recognise it. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's not really something that I, I know too much about. The only reason I know too uh, like that much about it is because I think we. I've done the Crucible at one point, and the Crucible is basically like, uh, funnily enough, it's like an allegory for uh, for communism yeah. chasing, which this episode is basically that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but basically, it's it's a it's an old old footage of them looking to sort of put someone in charge to find out, find and sort of get rid of communists in America. And in this video, he sees his dad in the background. Mm which sort of stirs something inside of him. And he ends up going back to um, Artie and threatens him with a subpoena and doesn't help him out. He says, you need to tell your story. I need to know what's going on because you've heard the name Mulder before. And so we get them sitting down. One thing I would like to note is Mulder's smoking in this episode. I did completely missed that until I was um, going back through the production notes and I was like, he was smoking. I must have looked away like at one second, but yeah. It's a very interesting scene, actually, mm. because they never show him smoking, mm. like, in the episode. I don't, I don't know whether this is, like, to show that, like, he used to be like this, but he, but he's not, or whether they don't want to show him smoking. I'm not mm. sure. But in the it, when it cuts to him, it cuts to him just as his hand's going off frame, and then he blows the smoke out. Yeah. It's okay, really, yeah. really strange. They don't actually show him smoking, but they make it clear that he is smoking, which mm. obviously... We know because that's why he eats sunflower seeds. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it definitely feels like um, when when I read that it was mentioned, it definitely feels like this is a hint at what we've mentioned before about the potential of cigarette smoking man being his dad. Um, so this is sort of like that kind of like little. I don't know if it's a hint or that little kind of like nudge at the audience to sort of. You know this kind of thing. Uh, the the one interesting thing I thought from that video as well though is. <laughs> I, I'm sure we've seen young Mold, Moldad before. It's been a while since we've <laughs> used that one. Um, I'm sure we've seen him before, but I did not recognise him at all. I'm so glad that Moldad said, oh, Dad, what are you doing there? Because you know, <laughs> <laughs> I would be absolutely lost else. <laughs> yeah. And to be fair, it is a blurry image as well. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't think you was expected to, so, which is why you do get Moldad. Dad. Yeah. It's so obvious that it's just like, let's let the audience know what you're seeing as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, So this starts up the flashback, which basically takes up the entire episode. Um, But it's, it's, we're watching the episode through Arthur Dale's point of view Mm -hmm. as a, a, well, a young Arthur Dale. And, well, first things first, I recognize this guy and I couldn't think of where I'd seen him from. I looked on IMDb, he said he was in like Dark Knight Rises, and I was like, oh, maybe that's it, I can't remember. But then you revealed something to me, which I really should have noticed. <laughs> that he was the marshal from Lost, yeah. Uh, he was uh, the guy who was very in Kate, sorry, spoilers for Lost, for the first few episodes of Lost. <laughs> the guy who's very in Kate on the, on the plane. And I was like, this guy, I think he's destined to just always play a law enforcer. <laughs> like, he has he's that kind that vibe. Yeah, definitely. He has that kind of, um, I mean, in this episode, he's actually a lot more, um, uh, what's the word? Compassionate, I suppose, to, to, to the people. Um, so yeah, it was, it was weird seeing him in that because I've seen him as such a hard ass before. And then this guy, this time, his partner's the hard ass and he's the kind of good cop, you know what I mean? Um, he has range. <laughs> I think he plays it perfectly. Yeah, I, I really, really liked his character and the, the, how he pl- played it. I don't want to like. You've got to be careful when you talk about stuff like this because it sounds you can sound a bit pretentious talking about like all oh, the nuance of character roles over this thirty minute episode. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Like at the end of the day, but at the risk of sounding pretentious, I do think this is a nuanced role. Like he's got to play this so well, even in the first scene. So. Him and his partner, um, Hayes, his partner is, they go, they're, they're being sent to arrest Skur for being a communist. And when they do, they rough him up a little bit. Like, it's, it all feels wrong right off the bat. Yeah, yeah. And even to the point where it's suggested that they find this communist sort of meeting card 
on, on, on his person, and it's suggested that it's been planted by Hayes. And you look at sort of um, Artie's face, and you can tell, you can tell that he's not okay with this, or yeah. he's got doubts, or but he's he's following. At the end of the day, who's he to turn down his superiors? You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. I do think this, it is a nuanced role, and I think he plays it perfectly throughout. Yeah, definitely. I mean, all the way through, he's he's got this like conf- conflict of somebody who's not happy with what's happening, and even in his like a uh, uh, dialogue of over the top of it as well from the the old version of him, he sort of narrates that. But you can tell from his performance that he's he's not happy with what they're doing, but he this is his job, and he's like he doesn't want to end up burnt by this. And yeah, um, th- there's a lot of times where he. Um, Right, it's only towards the end, really, where he starts defying them. But that's, I mean, to save his own skin, really, at the end of the day. And it's, um, yeah, I, I think that the role um, that he played, yeah, is 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 really, really good, to be honest. Yeah, um, obviously, he's still not feeling good about himself. He ends up going to a local bar to drink his worries away, um, and this is where he gets a call from his partner informing him that Skur hung and killed himself in his cell yeah. that night, which obviously sort of, he doesn't even respond to it, he just puts the phone down, but obviously it's just it's just the guilt filling him up, because he, he doubted it in the first place, yeah. and now he thinks he's got someone's blood on his hands. As, especially um, with the, the sort of reaction he got from the, the wife and kids as well, when they, they were taken yeah. away. There was that like, lingering shot on them to sort of show that he's Disrupting a family, yeah. Well, yeah. At this point, we just think Skurs is just a family man. We don't. We, there's nothing else to point towards anything else. Um, this scene I want to talk about a little bit. This bar scene, because this is the first indication I got that we're kind of going down a little bit of a film noir type feel. Yeah. Um, it doesn't go all the way. I mean, it's not. It's not black and white, but oh, and like, so you don't have like the lingering street lamp shots mm. and all the classics that you usually see in film noir films, but. It had the core elements I found. It had the sort of the tension, the ambience music. It also had like the sort of old arty narrating it. Yeah, yeah. And sort of talking through his actions as he goes along. I felt like this was a perfect sort of theme for this episode. I thought it worked really well with the story they were telling. Yeah, I think the the theme in and, of, and just the setting of this episode as well in the 50s, like the, the, the way everything looked as well. It just had this like perfect... Um, it just captured it perfectly. I think. Um, yeah, I, I I was really impressed with how they sort of got this looking so different to every other X Files episode, just based off of the time and the, the the theme of what they were tackling. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, we'll get to it later when he he does meet a young Bill Mulder. Um, what do you think about the choice to? focus on this character and not focus on Bill Mulder's character? Um, I didn't think too much of it other than that, like, it's sort of, this is his, from his perspective, I suppose. So, um, I mean, um, Bill Mulder would have still been alive at this point. So, I mean, we could have heard from his perspective, but it was never about him. You know what I mean? So it was always Mm -hmm. about his, I mean, I mean, we do see something from his perspective later on, but, um, but this was never his story, so he's always going to be kind of the initially. It's that kind of like classic. <laughs> it's weird to say, it, but he's the femme fatale in this role. You know what I mean? Like he's the guy who in, in, initially you think is you know helping and towards towards the same goal as you, and then he screwed him over at the end, basically. Um, yeah, the game set up, um, and yeah, it's it's that. It's that kind of like stereotype of, of like these like film noir films. I think of of yeah, like the betrayals between the characters and stuff like that. And again, it just I think the capturing that kind of setting. I, I think it did did it really well. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting you mention um, him playing the femme fatale role because I mean, if you follow that sort of train of thought, it's also. Like, it keeps... I think the, the important thing about it is it keeps the um, the mystery to Bill Mulder. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. You're left this episode probably knowing less about Mulder than you thought you did, old Bill Mulder. Yeah, Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, 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 it feels like a more mysterious character, even more than he already was. Yeah, because really, by the end of this, you don't know... Well, 
you can kind of see that he's got some kind of heart, but you don't know what his ultimate intentions are with this this wider conspiracy. Um, so yeah, and he he's still a character that we know very little about. Um, and I mean, it definitely feels like they're they're bringing him back up. Uh, is is on purpose? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Like he's been dead for a while now, and we've not heard too much about him other than Mulder bringing up about Crytek. So it's it's interesting that he's brought up now, right towards the end of of this series, when we've saw, saw more stuff about um, cigarette smoking man and potentially being Mulder's dad. There's definitely it's it's definitely bringing these up for a reason. I think. Agreed. Agreed. I think. I feel like we're going to find out a lot more about Bill Mulder's life over yeah. the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, struck with guilt, um, Artie decides he's going to go back and he's going to speak to Skur's wife. Um, and, he, and he heads back there. But as he heads back, he actually sees Skur turn up himself yeah. at the house. And he calls his name, he gives chase, and they end up sort of in this scuffle in the back garden. And Skur gets the upper hand, pins him down, still, you know, claiming his innocence, but then his eyes roll back, he opens his mouth, and what looks like spider legs starts crawling out of his mouth. Yeah, yeah, we get this. I mean, it's a horrifying scene, especially when we see later, like, these other things in there. But I, my favourite thing about this is that it flips that communist, like, kind of... Do, do you know, like... um uh, what's it? Um, uh, invasion of the Body Snatchers is told yeah. the aliens are like an allegory for um, uh, communists because they couldn't say that at the time because you know they they were worried that they'd end up getting um, billed as a communist themselves, so they yeah. couldn't they couldn't do that. But in this case, they've taken that like idea and flipped it around that this guy who they're labeling as a communist is actually an alien. You know what I mean? Like it's, I, I thought it was really, really clever how they did that. Of like that just flip on the, on the, on the, the usual premise that sci fi tends to go down. So I, I really, really like that, that story element to it. Yeah, it was enjoyable and it also horrific as well. Like it yeah. just looked. I mean, it freaked me out. I'm, I'm not a fan of spiders anyway. And I say, it looked like a spider leg as soon as I saw it. It freaked me out. But we don't get to see the full shebang just yet because no. they are interrupted by a neighbour. Skur runs off. And, well, in between scenes, Artie goes back and files a report about seeing Skur alive and well and knowing that he's not dead anymore. Yeah, yeah. Complete, okay. completely oblivious to what kind of problems this might be causing. <laughs> well, yeah, he's just following what his job. He's doing his job at this point. He is, however, reminded, or well, not even reminded, he's told that maybe doing his job isn't the right thing for him to do right now. He's told this by a, a mysterious guy um, that is later revealed to be Mr. Cone, his name is. Mm. Um, he is... he announced himself as the lawyer and I, I didn't, don't know the case. What was the case that he was working on? Do you, did you take note of that? Um, Rosenberg or something like that? Oh, for the Rosenbergs, yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure yeah. of the case. I've never heard of it. I imagine they're probably like, uh, again, we're, we're uh, caught up in all this like communist like um, scaremongering and stuff like that. Sure. I have... Bear with me. Let me have a quick look. Okay. So I'm just a quick look has told me Julius Rosenberg and Ethel Rosenberg were American citizens who were convicted of spying on behalf of the Soviet Union. Oh, are they are they the people do you know that the that program The Americans? Is it that based on them? I've never watched it, sadly. No. The couple was accused of providing top secret information about radar, sonar, jet propulsion engines, and valuable nuclear weapon designs. Okay. At that time the United States was the only country in the world with nuclear weapons. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that that makes sense. Then yeah, it's that kind of yeah. yeah. So I wasn't I wasn't aware of the Rosenbergs, but this guy uses the fact that he's involved in the Rosenbergs case to prove to Artie how important he is, how much control he has in this country, and then he not so subtly tells him, "You need to retract your statement about seeing Skr alive," and he tells him that basically he doesn't care whether it's true or not. What he cares about is information that shouldn't be public being made public mm. for no good reason. 
And it, you definitely can see like shades of Mulder in this guy. Like, I mean, he's not going as hard to sort of fight for the truth, but you can definitely feel like he has that kind of moral obligation that this isn't right. You know what I mean? Like, and they, they, we shouldn't be doing this, but he's just a guy doing his job. So, yeah. Yeah. And you see a sort of a glimpse as he's like sort of basically retracting the information from the report and blacking out all the information. And it's basically just like the entire page. And he's, he's feeling guilty about doing it, but he does basically just get rid of all that, all his reports that he, that he saw Skur alive. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that was left in the report is that Skur and two accomplices was involved in communism. Everything else on that report blacked out and retracted. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, later on, um, Artie and his partner are called to investigate... Um, another death. Um, a German doctor in Chevy Chase, Maryland. This one, <laughs> which I didn't realize was a real place. I thought it was made up. I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh, they named it after the act. <laughs> <laughs> this, this. So basically, they turn up at this house, and as they're going, they're told the local police need their assistance, but there's no local police there, and they go inside and. They're looking around the house, and the police do turn up, guns trained on them. Yeah. And basically, what we found is they've they've been Scooby Dooed. They've yeah. uh, both been called to the same place, but no one's mm. no one's. It's someone set this up, basically. Yeah. And we find out as well that this victim was a, a German, as well. They 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 mentioned. <laughs> I I love how it captures that like post war xenophobia. Like these two guys had fought in World War Two, so. They keep calling this guy a kraut, you know what I mean? Like, and they're, they're like really annoyed that this guy is. There's a picture of him shaking hands with the president. I don't know if he was like a German scientist that, because that, that happened and they like defected before mm. like, um, uh, the, like, like the Soviets took over. So I know there was all that going on. But yeah, I, I can, you can sort of get that feeling of just annoyance that they were fighting against the Germans. And then, yeah, there's all this kind of like, weird nationalism, I suppose, going on at the time, yeah, following on from World War II. I think it's um <clears throat> I think it's actually gonna play a bit more of an important role than we think because it does seem to be sort of hinting at maybe not so much the World War, but sort of the aftermath of World War II and then sort of throughout the Cold War, it does start to hint at the fact that a lot of these X file cases are kept secret and kept hidden because like you said they're, they're experiments that happened in a, in a, in a time of war mm. or they're enemy experiments that we brought over and started experiments in secret do you know what I mean and there's a yeah. lot of that throughout the this this season especially as I mentioned it a few times um, and you see that here where they do they, it's all hush hush this is where the this, this sort of syndicate starts do you know what I mean mm. I'm, not, I'm not just talking about the actual syndicate I'm talking about the sort of culture of like lying to your own government and having these secret operations. This is it's starting this era. Yeah, Do you know what yeah. I mean. Oh, the, the the that espionage kind of. I mean, that, that's Cold War one hundred and one, and it at least like yeah. they obviously they're not firing shots at one another, so they have to sort of do it another way where where they're like um yeah it's all spies and and i mean that's well, that's what the Rosenberg case was, I suppose. If they were they were done for espionage. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> what they do find at this house is well, I say they find Artie finds is a basically a, a card for a club, and it's he turns it over and says "Come alone" on it, and yeah. he knows instantly that they've been set up that they've been brought there for a reason, and he doesn't tell anybody. He puts it in his pocket, and he goes to this bar. I think it's called the Owl or something like that. Uh, the hoot, yeah, something like the hoot owl, and it or something like something that. Yeah, like it's that, the yeah. it's the one he was in earlier. Yeah, so he ends up going to this bar, and he goes to this table, and he meets a guy who, I mean, I kind of guessed who it was straight away, but yeah. it kind of sets it up as if it's meant to be like this big reveal later. Yeah, but this guy says he's an agent from the State Department, and he starts telling him that Skur is part of this bigger thing that's going on. Him and the two accomplices that was mentioned in the report, Gissing and Oman, um, 
they were just experimented on. And that's why they're being killed, because they this they're trying to keep this quiet. Yeah. Basically. And Gissing and Oberman have already killed themselves, or supposedly killed themselves. And Skur was supposed to be killed, but he's escaped and now they want him back to either hush him up or finish the experiment. Yeah, exactly. I, it, it it was definitely shades of like deep throat and X in this scene that that we basically find out that Mal, Mal, uh, that Bill Mulder was essentially the first one of these like whistleblowers for the X Files, I suppose. Um, Very good point. Yeah, which, I hadn't even thought of it like that, but yeah, he is. Yeah, because he's on the inside and he knows the information. Yeah. But he's choosing to do the morally right thing. Yeah, of like sharing it with an outside agency to try and... But at this time, it just seems like they're too big to, to tackle. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, they, they have the easy get out. They can just credit you as a communist and that's it. You're done. No one will listen to you and you, that's it. So, and, Well, they hint that in this episode, don't they? Where hmm. they, later on, they threaten Artie with... If you don't, if you don't follow our rules... Then how have you done for communism? And Artie says, "Well, I'm not a communist. I've been fighting against the communists." Mm. And then Cohn t- turns around to him and says, "You're a communist if I say you're a communist." Yeah, yeah. And that's the power that they have. It, it's it is this sort of Salem witch hunt type yeah, stuff where yeah. they don't need to prove anything. All they need to do is the slight because everyone's so worried about it. The slight indication that you're a communist, and that, that's all. That's the job done. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they, they they don't have to do anything at that point. No one will listen to you because oh, you're an enemy. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, it's 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 an interesting like period of time, and like it's it's mad that you can have that level of power just over what is essentially just a different ideology. You know what I mean? Like a different political leaning. Um, yeah, it's just really, really interesting and, yeah, a worrying time, I guess. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, yeah, this agent does, like, I, like we said earlier, reveal himself to be Mulder, Bill Mulder. Um, does a lot of work with his eyebrows, this actor. He <laughs> constantly looks through his eyebrows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but he mentioned that Skur is the guy that killed the German doctor. Mm. Obviously... We were left to assume that the German doctor was the one experimenting on him. But Mulder worries that Artie and his partner might be in trouble too because Skur thinks he's involved. Skur is going around killing people who was involved in his kidnapping or his experimentation. Obviously, this isn't something that he volunteered for. He's getting revenge. And it's at this point where Artie realises, hang on, my partner could be in trouble. And he goes, picks up the phone, calls his partner, who's just having a lovely beer with his cat. Yeah. Kind of I love that the hard-ass detective is a cat guy. <laughs> of course he is, of yeah. course he is. But sadly, he is. At, he doesn't get to the phone because the phone line's cut, and we see Skur pin Dales down, and we see those appendages come out of his mouth again, and we're left to... The rest is left up to our imagination as we yeah. see a side shot of what looks like something coming from his mouth, Skur's mouth, into Dale's mouth. Yeah, yeah. Not it's, da- it's not Dale, sorry. Uh, it's, um, Hayes. Hayes, yeah, that's it. I like how he's, he's, called, he's called Michael Hayes, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, which, yeah, I just got to gotta laugh out of. I don't know if that's intentional at all. <laughs> um, but, yeah, um, really, really um, just disturbing kind of image. Um, and I know they're getting they're getting better at making these like really upsetting like visuals. Um, this season in particular yeah. has been phenomenal for that. And I love. Sorry to interrupt you there, mm-hmm. but I love the fact that they they I think they've nailed the idea of not needing to show too much. Mm. You they, they show and they tend to do this quite a few times where they show just enough to sort of give your imagination something to work with. And then they let your imagination do the rest of the work. Mm. What? How many times have you seen a shot where something like this happens and the camera lifts up as you hear screaming? Yeah, do you know yeah. what I mean? And I think that it's such a clever way to do it, especially with the, the budget that they must have had. Like, yeah. it, it must save a lot of money. And uh, what we imagine 
what what they can show isn't anything like what we can imagine. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because they, I mean, they've already done the groundwork. They've kind of showed you sort of what the monster is, so we know that it's some kind of spider thing, mm-hmm. uh, and that it's going into their mouth. You don't need to know, like, actually see it happen. Like, I mean, you do see like the sort of legs you going. See, in. Like a shadow, don't you? You, you I think. Uh, it's you like a profile view of the, it, like it's, the shadow of it's it. Like it's like side on. You see like the legs going in, but you don't like see it fully. I guess mainly for practical reasons, I would imagine. But mm-hmm. but yeah, like I said, it's <laughs> you can do all the the, the legwork yourself because yeah, it just looks horrible from that, and just the, the image of it alone is just yeah, <laughs> it, it was it was horrible in the best way. Yeah, definitely. Um, so art is obviously. A little bit more inclined to investigate this now. He starts trying to figure out what Mr. Cohen's up to, but oh, sorry, he starts to in, try to investigate the murder or what happened to him. But Mr. Cohen is covering it all up. He keeps on sort of getting in the way and telling, basically, he has every opportunity telling him not to bother. Um, and then we get a scene where he's at the FBI office. He's kind of feeling lost. He doesn't know where to turn at this point. And he gets help from an unlikely source. It's a secretary at the FBI office mm-hmm. um, called Dorothy. And Dorothy mentions that she's kind of just like this happy-go-lucky character. And she she would seem inconsequential to someone like Mr. Cohen. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, she's not a problem. She's not going to be a problem. But it's interesting because she actually knows the information about what's, what's going on just from the fact that she just read some of these files that no one cares about Mm -hmm. they've been locked away and no one's ever touching them and she reads them because they're interesting because they're funny stories yeah exactly and i like the fact that this is the so say this is the start of the syndicate or this is the start of this sort of major conspiracy that we see in modern day i like the fact that they've got better at this but back in the day when it's the 50s let's be honest and women weren't considered to be a threat in the workplace or they weren't considered to be as intellectually sort of superior as men. Do you know what I mean? They was often overlooked. Yeah. And I love the fact that it was this that started it off. It, it, it wasn't it wasn't some, like, brilliant mind that figured it all out. It was just someone being overlooked just because they're a secretary. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And um, I, I like the, the entire origins of this as a whole because it's so – because obviously we, we know it as the X-Files – We've known it as, as the X Files for all this time, and have come, have always wondered how how is how has this name come about? And then when she explains what it is, it's so like oh that that makes sense, I suppose. <laughs> like it's so like it's just basic, really. It's um yeah. So the X Files and the origins of the X Files is unsolved cases, and it's implied that it's cases that she's been told to file away. Not necessarily because they can't be solved, but because they just don't want to look into them anymore. It's yeah. like just dead cases, basically. Yeah. And he, Artie says, "Well, why don't why do you mark them as you or for unsolved?" And she goes, "I did, but there's too many, and X doesn't have any cases in, so I just started marking them under X." Yeah, yeah. It's such a yeah. an unremarkable origin for this. Yeah, for this it's- iconic title of the of the of the of the mysteries. Yeah, it's just like I said, it's really like quaint, uh, and in like how it's how it comes about, and it's like oh, it, it makes sense, it completely makes sense, and it's not this big bombastic sort of oh, it's called the X Files because they're extra special or something like you know really. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been better though. <laughs> I feel like that. <laughs> you know, what I mean? it's literally just an alphabetizing system, and it's like oh, okay, yeah, that make, that makes sense. Just stick them all in X. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, Dorothy helps. Um, Artie figure out where she's seen the name Kissing before and it leads Artie to the morgue in which Kissing's body still lies and he can't believe it's still there and the um, the mortician basically says well the government are trying to sort of cart this out and it's trying to go to another two facility but there's a big conflict between him and the family basically there's a lot of red tape and it's just sort of being held in stasis at this point yeah and they investigate the body, and Artie kind of comes up with a theory after seeing a scar on the body's chest. Mm. And the theory revolves around the three men having 
the same doctor, this German doctor that died. And he starts to figure out that he thinks experiments was done on these people or some sort of surgery against their wishes. And he asks the mortician to open them up. And after a little bit convincing, they do a um, autopsy on the body. And what they find is something that's been put there by a surgeon because there's this, is it, oh, I don't know the word, it's sutures. Sutures, yeah, just like yeah. stitching, basically, isn't it? Uh, yeah, is, is that an American word, sutures? You don't hear that? I don't know, um, like stitches over here, isn't yeah. it? But, I don't know if there's a difference or, yeah, if it's just like a, the same thing but a different word. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but anyway. Um, it's, so we know what, like, whatever it is has been put there and they take it out and they sort of open up like this sort of sack and this spider thing, and it's, I can only call it a spider thing, because that's yeah. all it is, really. That's what it it's looks like, yeah. a horrific sort of thing in the body that's been put there, and it just, much to their surprise, it, it's alive and it's crawling about, and they actually take it out of the body in this, at this point. Yeah, so we, we've fully seen what this creature is inside them now. Um, and yeah, um, so again, just looks... Terrifying. <laughs> I can't Absolutely imagine anybody perfect. would want this inside them. So, so but this proves what well, it basically proves Artie's theory that these guys have been experimented on, and he goes to do the morally right thing. He goes to tell Skur's wife, mm-hmm. and I'm not sure whether he's he says he's after um, Skur himself, and he wants to sort of fact, if his wife knows, he wants to know where Skur is. Yeah, and um, but I also think there's a little bit of him that wants to even if she doesn't know, wants to tell her that he knows he's not a communist. He knows that he's got a story that the other person doesn't know about. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, basically. He's to try and absolve himself a bit, I guess. Yeah. But she, Skur basically says that she keeps, she stands by her, her husband and she tells this guy, or she tells us that she doesn't know anything and keeps telling him to leave the property and whatnot. But what she does do is straight after he's gone, she goes into the back garden, and it's like this little sort of hatch at the bottom of it where Skur is staying. Mm. And okay. the problem is, Skur turns around and says he can't control anymore. He's, he's, he's sweating. He's he, he doesn't seem to be himself, and he ends up pinning his wife down and transferring this whatever this spider thing is into her, much like we saw with Hayes in the earlier um, scene. Yeah, so I, I guess at this point we've sort of come to the conclusion that this like spider thing li- lives in them, but eats other people. <laughs> you know, you know, like gets its like some system. sort of parasite. I yeah. mean, all we really know about it is that you would assume it's a German. Would you assume it's a Nazi experiment, or would you assume it's just like a German soldier that's deferred over and it's, and it's an American experiment? I'm not sure. Um. <sighs> It's it's not it's unclear. I mean, you would assume that it's like started just because of like the World War Two connection and stuff like that, and the the doctor was German. You kind of think was it like a Nazi like uh, experiment like like experiment that she had been brought over? Um, I know that definitely, like I said, in real world history that happened. So it's not a, it's not a million miles away that something like this in, in the X Files universe would be would be happening. I guess so. Yeah, I don't know. but it looks like some sort of parasite that transfers from body to body. Mm. Um, and she does; she screams, and like the, the hatch is open. You'd think someone would hear it, but unfortunately, Artie has already been taken away because Cone turns up with Mulder and another person. I'm not sure who the other person was. Really, it's never mentioned. Um, but they turn up and they take him away against the car, and they end up taking him to someone who is only listed as. The director. Mm. Any idea? See, this might be Luke. Well, I mean, just by looking at him, you kind of go, "Well, I think it's Edgar Hoover." <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> yeah, that, basically, I yeah. think they. I think it's it's insinuated that that is him. Yeah. yeah. It's weird that they don't list him as that though. Is there some kind of like maybe they couldn't get rights to his name or something like that? Or, or I don't know. Possibly. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know how it works. They do mention him earlier, earlier on yeah. in the episode. Yeah, it's weird. Like, surely if it's a public record, then I don't know. I, I don't know what the reason is. I, I haven't seen anything in the production notes, but maybe there is something. But Or maybe it was meant to be a surprise. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Who knows? But the director basically 
gives Artie this huge speech. In 1945, at the time of the first conference to map out the peace after the Second World War, there lived within the Soviet orbit 180 million people. Lined up on the anti-totalitarian side at that time were 1,625,000,000 people. Today, Mr. Dales, just seven years later, there are 800 million people under the absolute domination of Soviet Russia. An increase of over 400%. In other words, in less than seven years, the odds have changed from nine to one in our favor to eight to five against us. The men we arrested weren't communists. If we are to defeat the enemy, we must use their tools. We must go further. We must do those things which even our enemies would be ashamed to do. You have one chance, Mr. Dales, to save yourself. To demonstrate that you have the strength to serve your country. But well, basically, the, the whole idea of the speech is patriotism, and it's imploring Artie to do what he needs to be done for, the, for his country. Yeah, basically. It's that kind of thing that, like, I think, yeah, a lot of people got conned into doing a lot of bad things in the country in those days, you know, in, in the Cold War. So, yeah, it's just another story of that. What's funny, I've, I I think, is I'd like, to, I'd like to take this sort of explanation and this sort of speech and compare it to things we found out in the first couple of seasons where... You know, we find out, and Mulder talks about this a lot, where they'll put like these, the government will put like these fake UFO stories out to cover up work that they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And it makes me laugh because it's kind of what they're doing in the 50s as well. They're using this fear that the general public have of this threat to, to do what they want to do to cover up what they're doing. Yeah. And they keep doing that. And when the Soviet Union and the and the communists stop becoming a fear, well, what else are the public afraid of? Aliens. Yeah. So yeah. We'll, we'll use aliens as a, as, a, as, a, as a cover up for some of our operations. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. I think that's, it's a clever sort of tie into both Mulder's stories. It, it'd be interesting. I, I don't know where the story will eventually go, but obviously I know... The buzzword in like the two thousands was like terrorism. You know what I mean? Like the fear of yeah. terrorism. So I wonder if it get when it gets into like the early two thousands to whenever like the whatever the newer series are, if that'll be the sort of like cover up that they use, or or will it be so far down the rabbit hole of conspiracy that that's just not going to fly? Maybe I don't know. Um, but that, that that's sort of I guess the the fear of our times. I guess. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I, I'm not sure whether they will. They would go down that route because I don't know. I know, especially after um, the attacks on 9 11, for example, it was a long time before it became something you could make shows about or you, yeah. can, you, you can mention it. Yeah. So obviously, as you can, as, as we all know, it, it, hurt, it still upsets a lot of people. And it, it was kind of a taboo subject for mm -hmm. a long time. Yeah. And so I don't think the X Files would probably mention that. But I think you're right in the sense of. If you were to make an X-Files series now based on that time, absolutely, that's what the syndicate would use. Yeah, of course yeah. they would, because that's what people are afraid of. And all they have to say is, oh, we're doing this because we believe that they are terrorists. And they could get away with whatever they wanted to Basically, do. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, after this scene with the director, um, Cone takes Artie back to the bar, the, the Hooting Owl, and Skur is there to meet him. And basically, long story sh short, they leave him to die. They yeah. leave him for Skur to kill Artie. Yeah. And when, when they think he's dead, and only when they think he's dead, and Mulder doesn't seem happy about this, but he lets it happen, mm -hmm. more importantly. Yeah. But when they think he's dead, they go back in and they find that Artie has actually managed to handcuff Skur yeah. and survive. Yeah, this encounter, yeah. It's a it's an interesting scene, this, because... Um, yeah, obviously, up until this point, we think that uh, Mulder's on his side, but um, obviously, it's he's he's uh, he's on his side up to a, a point where he's not going to stick his own neck on the line. And yeah, this this guy is sort of I I guess they've sort of set it up so it 
takes out two birds with one stone. They'll catch this guy and uh, I've got rid of the only witness. You know what I mean? Like in, in yeah. one fell swoop. swoop. So um, it's it's interesting. And, and, and at this point, this is where you can see where his confidence in the FBI and uh, the uh, sort of the American government as a, as a whole is rocked to the point where they, they'd let him die for this. And it's like, why, why is he, why is he sort of sacrificing himself? So you can see this sort of like beginning of the end of his trust and how he ends up as this old man from, from just this scene. Um, Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it would be, it was interesting hearing your comparison for of Bill Mulder to Deep Throat earlier in the episode, because yeah. this scene in particular gave me very, um, X vibes. Yeah, yeah. In the sense of X was similar, where he he tried to help and he would give information where he could, but only as long as it didn't affect him. Yeah, yeah. He and wouldn't he wouldn't intervene and put himself at risk. Even at the and point where he would like, if Mulder took it too far, he'd be chastising for it and be like, "You're gonna get me found out." Basically, at this exactly. point, exactly. Yeah. And Mulder <laughs> seems to be on the same wavelength, at least at this point. Yeah. Which is very interesting because it you compare it to Fox Mulder, who seems to have the same morality, the same ideology as Bill, but maybe it's just that little bit more courageous, maybe has the heart to stand up for what he believes in. Yeah. Yeah. But we go back to present day and Fox Mulder, speaking of him, <laughs> is upset and he he can't believe what he's heard about what his, his father was involved in. And he's definitely lingering on the fact, not the fact that his father tried to help, but the fact that his father was even involved in the first place. Yeah. And he can't quite believe it. Um, but he's got one more question and he can't figure out how Skurs escaped. He was in the custody of Cone. Like, how did he end up get, getting away? And old Artie turns around and says, I, I honestly don't know. Maybe there's someone out there that wants the truth to be known. Maybe there's someone that helped. And we, at the same time as this sort of voiceover, we do see a, a, a video of Mulder driving Skur away, giving him the keys to his car and walking away and letting Skur run free. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know if this is the house that we saw saw him at the beginning, but yeah. Because um, it's like that kind of like road, isn't it, in the wilderness? But I'm not sure whether, yeah, yeah I'm not sure whether it was the house. I didn't, I didn't pick yeah. up on that if it was, but yeah. He lets him get away, basically. Yeah. Um, they do mention that he, regardless of like whether Bill Mulder wanted the truth to come out one day, he did let go of a murderer. Like, that, that can't be overlooked. He... He is still a murderer. It, it, it is funny, isn't it? Because, like, at this point, it's like they're saying, uh, he, he maybe he had a heart at the end and he let this guy go. And it's like, I I get the point, but, yeah, th- this the alien inside him is going to continue to kill people. And, I mean, up until the point that he gets shot, it was continuing to kill people for, like, to sort of sustain itself. So, yeah, he let, let a, a mass murderer go and it's got, God knows how many people this guy killed. Yeah, exactly. He seemed, he seemed um, to get through about three people in, uh, what, the space of a week? So. Yeah. <laughs> and we already know he killed somebody else at the beginning with a yeah. guy in the bathtub. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, really, really strange. But, I mean, I think the point to be taken away is Mulder did what he thought was right because yeah. he wanted the, the overall truth to be revealed. Yeah. Um, and that's where we end the episode. Uh, on that sort of image of Mulder walking away from the car. Um, what did you think of this episode as a whole? I really like this episode. Like as as a as a sort of coming off of the last episode, I expected it to be a bit uh, less connected to like sort of things that were going on and and bringing characters like um, Bill Mulder into it. Um, but I just thought as a one off, like completely taking none of the characters that we we sort of know and love, and putting in a completely different setting and era. Um, and just the, the the way the themes were changing it, I just thought it captured all of that perfectly. Um, I really, really like the sort of flip on that the communists are actually aliens and not like this kind of parable for for them. Uh, and yeah, I thought that the, the main guy, De- uh, the guy who played Dales, um, I think the actor's name, I do have it on a note here, uh, Darren McGavin. Um, I thought he was absolutely brilliant in this sort of lead role. Completely agree. Um, 
Yeah, um, I thought it was really, really good. Like, I wasn't expecting a, an episode this good to come right after what we'd just seen. Oh, we must get so boring because <laughs> I completely agree with a lot of what you've said. Um, it was, it's, it's a really good episode, it really is. I'm always going to be a sucker for world building episodes like this. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's just because of the way that's the way my mind is, that's the way my brain's wired. I like so, some of the things that interest me, especially in like these TV shows, these long form, long running TV shows. One of the things that majorly interests me is what what does this, these characters' actions do to the rest of the world? What does the rest of the world look like because of this storyline? Mm, yeah, exactly. And so episodes. Episodes like this really, really interest me. It's kind of like why I, I'm really enjoying. Um, I, I know you've been watching it as well, but um, One Division, yeah, which yeah. is um, a part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and I'm a fan of that anyway. But one of the great things that Marvel have really tapped into is going, well, this is a character. This is what happens. Now let's see what happens to this character that's introduced and this character, and let's see what happens when this character does this and this character does that, and what happens to this society. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it, it's like a big spider web, and I, I, my brain is wired to really love that sort of stuff, and I, I like it when the X Files does it as well, which is why I enjoyed the cigarette smoking man episode so much, mm. and to a similar extent, I really enjoyed this one. It's, I just thought it, it gave you that insight into sort of where the origins of all this came from and the style of it that that sort of noir style just really worked for yeah, it it yeah. just had that sort of tension to it which really made the episode pop for me luke's production note This episode was inspired by the story of Howard Dimsdale, a screenwriter who had been negatively affected by the Hollywood blacklist in the 1950s. Dimsdale wrote several movies under the pseudonym Arthur Dales, a name which eventually made its way into the episode. Uh, For many years, Dimsdale was an instructor at the American Film Institute in Los Angeles, where he taught executive producer Frank Spotnitz and co-producer John Chaban. While developing this episode, the two decided to combine many of Dimsdale's stories of paranoia, treachery and double dealing with the idea that the witch hunt was actually a smokescreen to conceal something else. The writers soon realised that by setting the episode in the past, they would be able to trace the roots of both Fox Mulder and the X-Files. Kind of what we said, but I like the idea that it all came about naturally. It wasn't like pre-designed hmm. to have the sort of the origin stories. It was just the idea behind the communist witch hunt was the, what, what led this episode to sort of try and be a little bit more edgy and a little bit more something different. Yeah, I, I like as well that it's like got that root in like somebody that the actual creators of the shoe uh, show, show creators of the yeah. show knew um and like they brought in his story i guess to sort of fill out that that sort of like yeah. um, this x file story yeah, it, it, that that's an interesting point um uh, scully did not appear in this episode as Jillian addison uh, as she was bil- uh, busy filming the final parts of fight the future um I mean, to be honest, whether it was written for her or not, she probably wouldn't have. I, I can't imagine her being in this episode anyway. You know what I mean? No, it doesn't fit. No, and, and, and there's no way for her to be in and, unless, unless like, um, I did think halfway through the episode, like you know, like the um, the guy who was uh, running the what you call it now, the examination on the body. Yeah, yeah, the mortician or whatever he was. I did think, oh, I, I thought at one point he was going to go, my name is Mark Scully. But then I thought, well, no, 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 it wasn't a family business. No. <laughs> go down. The, the only way they could have got her in, in this, I think, is if there was like a scene at the end where Mulder's going back to the FBI and just like walks past her or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah but yeah. I feel like that's a bit like, oh, come on. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Like it's too, but anyway. She wasn't in the episode. <laughs> um, noted actor Darren McGiven uh, appears as Arthur Dale. He was requested for the part, especially by Chris Carter. Casting director Rick Milliken uh, noted McGavin was uh, Chris's inspiration for writing this series. 
he always had Darren in mind to use somewhere and uh, that was really uh, and that was really his doing. He said I wanted Darren McGiven for this and he happened to be available and we got him. McGiven was originally had originally been casting director's first choice for the role of Senator Matheson for the season the second season opener Little Green Men. Um so there you go. We, uh, Interesting. I can I can see why they wanted him. I really can. He, he brought he brought something. As I say, sounds really pretentious, but he did bring that sort of nuance that this role asked for. <laughs> and it also there's a there's a final point in that they they sought him out to be Mulder's dad as well. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, that didn't work out. So yeah, this they've wanted this guy for a while then. But he, uh, I mean. I've only really seen him in Lost, but I, I guess in the nineties he must have been like the shit and in like yeah, TV possibly. TV acting at the time. So, but I mean he's great in Lost, so I can understand. <laughs> you yeah. mean um, because the show's fifth season was filmed under a number of financial and time rest- uh, restraints. Uh, production for Travelers was somewhat rushed. Cost- uh, costume designer Jenny Gullett was forced to frantically rent or create the vintage. Uh, clothing featured in the episode and art director Gary Allen did extensive research to make J. Edgar Hoover's office look realistic Allen also constructed the bomb shelter uh, because his father was a contractor uh, who had already built several Um, there you go a lot of rushed Um, special effects supervisor Toby Lindala created the alien spider as well as uh, a special facial appliance that uh, Garrett Dillahunt who played Skur, uh, mm. war. Um, the final film was slightly bleached in post production to give it a vintage appearance, and the production staff were pleased with the final product, noting that it uh, does justice to both the painful controversy of the 1950s and the X Files as a contemporary TV series. Speaking of like rushing to get the all set together, I didn't notice that throughout where I was, I kept on finding myself thinking. God, how much money did they put into this? Like, even just like the old cars, and do you know what I mean? Like mm. the, the old sets and the desks with all. They, they must have had to. I don't know whether they. Uh, I can only assume that they must find that sort of stuff from another studio and just sort of lend it for. It. They're not going to buy everything new, no. are they? Uh, for one episode, it must be. Yeah, it must be rented from somewhere. But yeah, for a rush production, it, it didn't look rushed at all. It it, yeah. it captured that that like era perfectly. I thought so. I mean, this is from someone who's never lived in the 50s, so so I don't know how authentic it was, but from from just from like knowing like films and TV that's all portrayed, yeah, it, it looked spot on. So, um, the episode contains several in jokes. The song playing in the German doctor's house is the popular song, uh, Lily Marlene, uh, of which a new recording was made specifically for the episode. The record sleeve attributes the track to Paula Rabuini or Rabuini. Uh, a reference to one of the series producers, Paul Rabwin. Uh, Agent Hayes Michael was named after the fiancé of cre- um, series creator Chris Carter's executive producer, Mary Astadorian. So there you go. Uh, some some in-jokes, I suppose, yeah. Uh, in-jokes? Yeah. But we, will, we would have never known. How, yeah. how, how, who, who finds this stuff out? Yeah, I've not... A, do you know what? This, this is the kind of stuff that either goes into, like, post-production books or, like, people ask questions or something like that at, yeah. like, a convention or something. It comes out that way, but, yeah. <laughs> never have... No clue who, who Chris Carter's executive assistant was, so no. I definitely would have, wouldn't have known the... Uh, <laughs> the what's it? The, the fiancé. Um, oh, Okay. I don't know if this... I'm going to read it. If this is potentially spoiler territory, we'll cut it. Uh, oh we'll redact it. But this oh is dear. this is something, to be fair, that people on Twitter have told us about before. So, I think we're okay. Okay. In several shots, Mulder can be seen wearing a wedding band. This was David Duchovny's idea. Uh, He explained, that was just me, you know, fooling around. I had recently gotten married and I wanted to wear it. He later described the situation as, so Mulder to never have mentioned that he was married. Series creator Chris Carter later told Duchovny that the situation creates a problem. If we ever do a show that takes place seven years ago, you'll have to be married. However, Duchovny reassured Carter by pointing out that there were not uh, very many episodes, if any, 
that it had been planned to take place seven years prior to the events of this episode. This inclusion of this detail caused an internet frenzy and the minor detail was never resolved on the screen. Interesting. Okay. Do you want to hear my theory? Go on. Yeah. I think Mulder wears the wedding... I think Mulder wears the, the, the ring because he thinks... It's a good way to pick up girls. <laughs> that is a very Mulder thing to do, to be fair. Yeah, I, yeah. I think he thinks that he's... He, it's a young Mulder, and he's he's sort of cracked into this... He thinks that this, this is the best plan in the world. I, I'm not saying it is, but he in his mind, he's gone, hang on, what what do ladies like? They like nothing more than a married man. That's a, <laughs> and I think that's what he's trying to do. He's, it's, his, it's his playbook. Okay, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's that's a mold of thought there. If I've ever heard one, but <laughs> I um, just, I do like the fact that it's just like a goof that he's put into himself. <laughs> yeah, he's done this just to wind people up, <laughs> and 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 it did because people. Well, we had people tweeting us about it, and you yeah. know what I mean. This is many many years after it happened, so. Yeah, interesting to. But then again, when it, when the wedding ring first showed up, um, I didn't notice it. No, and not I didn't notice it in this episode. Either. No, neither did I. We are absolutely but, useless. <laughs> yeah, fair play for people who didn't yeah. notice it. Cause yeah, I, I do wonder who noticed it naturally, like when they were watching the episode, whether they picked up on it. Uh, but to be honest, I I don't think I look for wedding rings on people in general like, no. I, I never noticed that sort of stuff no. do you know what I mean so do you know what though it's I, I think it's one of those rewatch things that like because um, I've noticed that like we were talking you were talking about WandaVision there's a lot of stuff from that that other people will pick up that I'm like how did they even like I'm just trying to watch the TV show and like yeah. there'll be some things that I'm like that's weird or this is interesting like here but most of the time I'm just trying to follow the plot so I'm not going to be like I don't know if this is a spoiler for anybody in the very first episode, like the, the wine bottle has the name of like an old X-Men comic in French. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, Oh, that that's cool. Like reference and like might be a hint of what's happening, but it's like, how did, how did anybody pick up on that? I would never have looked for that, but I, th- yeah. I think the episodes are made with that in mind. Yeah, they've yeah. got like these multiple layers that you can yeah. watch them time and time again and pick up something new every time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in this this situation, in this instance, I don't think it was that nuanced. I think it was um, just more the going. This will be fun. Yeah, basically. Well, not all that, sorry, the company. <laughs> it stinks. Welcome to the Critex Files. Critex Files. I think. Well, this is a tough one. I'm going to go with an 8.9. Ooh, that is quite that's high. A high. That's yeah. a high one for me. I really enjoyed it. And I'm not saying it is an 8.9, but I think for me, it's just my type of episode. I yeah. like the sort of the style of it. And so, yeah, I, I'd watch this again, no problem at all. Yeah. 8.9. I was around that sort of ballpark, to be fair. I gave it like an 8.5. So I'm, I'm kind of, yeah. I, I think... I was going to give it an 8, but I was like, I like this a lot more than other episodes I've given an 8. So I have to mm. at least give it, like, that extra bit. But it's it's hard now. I was I was going through rating, like, episodes on IMDb the other day, and I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, I've rated a lot of, like, 7s to 8s, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Every, yeah. everything sort of falls in between that. And then there's, like, you get the occasional ones where it's, like, a 10 out of 10 or whatever. But, yeah, it's, um, yeah, there's... I, I'm waiting because, like, people have told us that there's a fall off point on yeah. on X Files, which I'm not looking forward to. If I'm completely honest, yeah, I'm riding the high wave at the moment. Of this is brilliant. This TV show is amazing, and then we're gonna hit like I don't know season eight or somewhere and go. What are we watching? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I do. I'm I'm waiting to see when that sort of like high eights, nines, tens is going to fall off and we're going to be in the doldrums. But yeah. so far, all, all, the, all yeah, the good no. times, yeah. And this has we been, haven't had to worry about that yet. Yeah. It, there's been a lot more good episodes than than I can remember being one than bad episodes, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, but finally, the, um, the IMDB voting population uh, from 2,419 votes gave it a 7.6 so a bit okay. l- a bit lower than what we gave but you know still a decent score i'd say 
I think that's fair. Like, I, I, I really do. Like I said, I'm not saying that I would give this such a high score, but it was just personally for me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think definitely th- there's a lot to take away from this if you're a fan of that kind of, like, era and style as well. So Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's about all we have time for this week. Um, we'll be returning next week for episode 16 of this season. We're getting towards the end. Um, and episode 16 is entitled Mind's Eye. Got any th- quick theories about what that could be about? I mean, it has to be something psychic, doesn't it, with Mind's Eye? There's got to be some something like that. that I, I didn't realise until looking up this episode, there's only 20 episodes this series, so we're rapidly fit- closing towards the end of it now. It's, uh, yeah, it's a short one. Yeah, we've got a couple of weeks left. And yeah. we, well, I, obviously the film as well. The film yeah. makes it a little... Are we including the film as... The end of this season or the beginning of next it, season? Oh, I don't know. It feels like it should be the end of this season, but I mean, fans of the show, let us know. Is this That's a good one? Is we'll this put a good out to it, fans of the show? Is this an ender or a or a starter? So yeah, um, I think I, I, we we've sort of mentioned bits and pieces of what we're gonna do, but I think it's just gonna be a, a sort of main episode. But we're gonna it'll probably be a longer episode, obviously, with 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 it being a I film. I dare say it's yeah. gonna be a longer episode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let us know, because um, obviously we have our post-season sort of rundown and whatnot. So let us know, would this film fit better at the end of this season, and then we can include it in our post-season breakdown, or should we include it at the beginning of next season to start off season six? Let us know, and then um, we'll go with popular consensus, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, but until then, and oh, and if you do with us now, you can just find us on any social media, most of the podcast. Um, but yeah, until then, we'll speak to you next week.